You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Welcome to American Sex, the award winning podcast dedicated to challenging those puritanical, backward ass ideals that we have in the U.S. I'm Sunny Megatron, and my co host is Ken Melvoin Berg. We're sexuality educators, pleasure advocates, and ridiculous sadistic kinksters. We're also non monogamously married to each other. So strap in or strap one on. In this house, your pleasure is power. Your kink is customizable. And your subversive perversions are revolutionary. Welcome, friends, to episode 194 of American Sex. I just love my sound effects button. I can never, ever get enough of them. So, last episode was titled Safe Words, Consent, and Customizing Your Kink. It was episode 193. I mean, y'all can do math. I just said this is 194. So anyway, you might be stoned. I don't know. Anyway, when we got to the end of that episode, or actually just me, because it was just me, uh, there was so much more to talk about. That episode was inspired by a listener request from Pup Colt and so much juicy stuff. So I decided we'd take it up this time. This episode is sort of a part two. However, it's also kind of a, a kink freestyle episode two. We'll be talking about consent and safe words and continuing our conversation from last time. However, there are a few other tidbits in there too that may not necessarily fit under the umbrella of safe words and consent, but we'll get there. I'll keep it a surprise. I got to have suspense somehow, right? Wait, I have a noise for that. Kind of, not really. Anyway, before we get to all of that, you know what we have to do. We have to wash the balls, which is housekeeping here on American Sex Podcast. And I promise this one's going to be quick. So the first thing, easy peasy and a free thing for you. It's a reminder since we're talking about safe words and negotiation and all of those things, I have a free negotiation mini workbook for you. Yeah, you can get it free. It's got a yes, no, maybe list, uh, different scene prompts, questions to ask during negotiations that are kind of outside of the box and not what you typically see on your average negotiation form. Uh, Lots of different prompts, like starting from the emotion you want to feel and working your way backwards and building your scene that way. Uh, There's also my and Ken's shorthand system for sort of macro level compatibility assessment and scene planning. It's rough BS. You can look at the sheet and see what that's about. And there's a whole lot more. So go get it. Like I said, it's free and we all like free stuff. So what else? there's really not a whole lot going on outside of my baby that I am busy shaping and molding, Zipper Magazine. So let me tell you about that. If you haven't heard, I am the editor-in-chief of Zipper Magazine, which is a brand new online publication dedicated to all things kink. So let me tell you about some of the highlights, You know, some of the things we published recently. I'm going to wet your whistle or... I don't know, that's not really kinky. Wet your whip, that, but that doesn't make sense. Well, it kind of does. It would hurt a little more. I don't know, whatever. Uh, so just this week, what's the safe word? You know, Pup Amp and Mr. Christopher, they did a kink talk react video for Zipper Magazine, and mm, it was good. We've got the legendary history of San Francisco's Folsom Street Fair by Kitty Stryker. I know Folsom's over. You went. Tell me how it is. Hit me up on Twitter because like, I've never been to Folsom. Secret, I know. Shh, don't tell anybody. What else? Uh, everything you need to know about safe words by me, of course. We talked about that last week. Also, the good and the, I'm not going to say bad, the, the good and the could have been better of Netflix's How to Build a Sex Room. We've got a beginner's guide to pegging. YCNC, consensual non-consent, isn't what you think it is by me. 
Evie Lupine joined us for some power exchange myths. Oh, oh, oh. And I've got a pervertibles primer and an inspiration gallery chock full of homemade BDSM toys, aka pervertibles by you, y'all. You send in your pictures. You're so damn creative. I can't even handle it. So go check out Zipper Magazine. I've got the link in the show notes, zippermagazine.com. And since we're new, you know, we're trying to grow our, our YouTube and our social medias and all the things, please follow along on Twitter, Instagram, give us a sub on, on YouTube, join the mailing list, all the things, because there is a lot more fun to come. Also, since you're going to be visiting the show notes anyway, which is aka the episode description, right? When you go on whatever streaming service you're listening to me on right now, go to the podcast page and all this cool stuff will be there. All of the links to this episode sponsors, a bunch of discounts for kink gear and sex toys. We've got the link to our Discord community that you can join for free all sorts of stuff. So that's in the episode description. However, however, I painstakingly format the show notes. And also I'll put in there anything I end up talking about in the episode. I'll put the links in there to all the resources, all the things you got it. But like I painstakingly format that shit with bullet points and H2 tags and the whole deal. And some podcast streaming services keep my formatting and then they have clickable links and it's so beautiful. And then others, it, I don't, it's like malicious compliance. Like, well, we've printed your show notes, but they're all jacked up and you know, you can't click the link. So if you're in one of those players, go to americansexpodcast.com and look for the episode notes for episode 194. Also in there, I got to tell you, there's a link to my other podcast. You know, I have two podcasts, right? Open Deeply that I co-host with sex positive licensed marriage and family therapist, Kate Lurie. Now, right now we are just wrapping up our six episode series. It's a lot, like more than six hours on consensual non-monogamy, aka polyamory, which is Kate's specialty as a psychotherapist. Plus, She walks the walk too. She doesn't just talk about it. She is non-monogamous in her own life. So I'm telling you, you know, I'm saying I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I do like there is intent behind this, right? Um, I am tooting my own horn and I'm tooting Kate's horn too, which that sounds all sorts of different ways. And you can think what you want to think in your head. I don't care. Just don't tell me about it. But anyway, I'm tooting everybody's horn because it's good. It's a really good series. We are getting all sorts of letters and notes from people who have really appreciated the not often talked about roads that we go down in this series. You know, of course, We start out with the 101 overview about consensual non-monogamy and the many forms it can take. And then throughout the other episodes, we break into communication and handling triggers, managing mental health issues within consensually non-monogamous relationships, uh, ways to maintain connection, uh, the role of compassion in these relationships for you your self-compassion, your partners, your metamors, that's a whole lots of compassion for the world. Like everyone gets compassion. Uh, But in the last episode, uh, which I think it drops, if you're listening to me on release day, happy Friday, by the way, have a good weekend. Like just go sleep a lot and smoke them if you do, drink them if you do, just relax, you know, have a little fun, good BDSM scenes, get those endorphins going, do what you need to do to restart the week in this capitalist hellscape. But uh, when you do restart that week, I'm pretty sure on Monday morning, our last in the series drops episode number six, which is all about coming out in the world of non-monogamy. So it's good stuff. Grab your partners, grab your metamors, grab grab yourself, you know, grab other people's horns. I don't know. Listen together. It'll give you lots to talk about. 
Oh, 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 there actually is one more thing before before we move on. I got to ask you a favor. If you listen to last week's podcast in the intro, I talked about that we are considering at some point in 2023 rebranding and changing the name of our podcast and no longer being American Sex. And that's for lots of reasons that I got into in the, the other podcast in the intro. So go listen. But we're having the hardest time coming up with an alternate name. And I think, you know, where I'm starting is, what are we now? You know, we started out over five years ago being about all things sex. And, you know, even though then a lot of our content centered around kink or alt sexuality, we're leaning even more into that these days where I would say it's probably a good 80, 90% of what we talk about, if not more. So do we, we rebrand as a kink podcast? Do we, and then there's social media and they don't like the word sex anymore. They barely like the word kink. So I'm stuck. Ken's stuck. We're trying to, we got this brainstorming list. So Hit me up on social media. Tell me, what do you think of a name? Or what do you even think like, how would you describe us? What are we? Tell me. I'm having a hard time. Thank you. So that's it. It is sound effect time because these balls are now clean. I need to have somebody, like we need a ball fairy, like a clean ball fairy that just like floats around your balls with a little wand and, and you know, does this noise. And uh, I don't know, I'm going to have to commission somebody to draw that. Maybe it's my cat because he's meowing right now, if you can hear him. Nigel, you don't have thumbs. You can't draw. Sorry. Anyway, so the balls are clean. Let's continue our conversation from last time. Um, by the way, I just want to say, it is not necessary to go back and listen to that episode. You can have this episode standalone a la carte, but I still think you should go back and listen to that episode because it's going to give you a little bit more context to what I'll be talking about today, you know, about the nuances and the murky, messy, imperfect human gray areas of BDSM. Okay, friends, so I want to start out with something just generically general, something that's been grinding my gears this week, uh, and it stems from some online discourse. And I want to stress for all of you when we're talking about kink or, you know, what we should do in this situation or what are the rules for that and what are the best practices for that? What consent model should you use? How, what negotiation form should you use? Yada, 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 yada. There is a difference between what is a personal preference and what is suitable to make fall out your mouth as just kind of a general rule that applies to everyone or a best practice or a <gasps> gasp, God forbid, you, maybe you didn't mean it, but it turns into sounding like a one true way ism. We all know my motto by now, right? The phrase I coined, kink is customizable. And while that's true, when we're having these bigger conversations with wide audiences in a more general sense, things get a little weird sometimes, okay? So me as an educator, I know that I'm talking to general audiences with all different points of view and different needs, et cetera. And when I teach, I'm going to teach from the general point of view, and I'm going to say, oh, some people choose to do it this way, but some people have a completely opposite point of view, and they actually prefer to do things this way, And right? And, you know, this is why these people do things this way, and this is why these people prefer the other way. I give you all the options, like the smorgasbord, because it's for you to decide. And I know y'all aren't educators, right? But I urge you when you are speaking on a social media platform, let's say, 
you know, whether it's a Facebook comment, a TikTok video, even speaking with uh, people at a local munch or in your local community, even though you may be like, look, I am not an educator. I'm just talking from my own personal point of view to be cognizant of when you say something that is your own personal point of view or your own preference, you make sure other people are aware of that, right? And I'll give you a brief rundown of why this is coming up for me this week. And, you know, specifics are always easier to grasp, right? I'm talking in generalities. You're like, what does this mean? I don't know. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. So there has been a long standing debate in the kink community over our different consent models. And I've talked about consent models in a number of other podcast episodes. So I'm just going to do a really quick drive by. I will put some links to some TikTok videos I've done that go more in depth on this in the show notes. But um, two that are super popular, there's more, but the two really popular ones are SSC, which is Safe, Sane, and Consensual, and also RAC, which stands for Risk Aware Consensual kink. And I'll give you the quick history. SSC was a term that was coined in the 80s at a time when uh, the BDSM community, as we know it now, was just forming people outside of the, the gay male leather community were, were coming in to kink during the AIDS crisis during the 80s and 90s. Kink was getting more publicity and more of the spotlight. And a lot of vanilla folks or people that didn't understand thought we were absolutely freaking bananas. They're like, these people are doing drugs and they're being irresponsible and they're, you know, stepping on kittens and they could kill each other. And it's like, no, you don't understand. Like consent is a thing. Negotiation is a, is a thing. So this term SSE, safe, sane, and consensual was invented, not only for the, the naysayers on the outside, but for even new people coming in that maybe were kind of predatory or kind of, you know, and it really worked at the time. It was exactly what the community needed. However, communities evolve, words evolve. And even the, the coiners of the term SSC, which I think was coined in like, I don't know, 1983 or something, uh, later said, you know what, that probably wasn't the best slogan. Like it worked at the time. But looking back, eh, you know, and a couple of the reasons that people take issue with SSC even though the spirit of SSC st will forever live, right? We know in general what it means. Like, don't do banana shit. Don't be irresponsible. Don't be drunk out of your mind trying to consent to things, right? And have consent, right? So spirit still stands. But when people really looked at what those words meant, they were like, well, safe, Nothing is ever safe, even walking outside of my door. You know, a, a roadrunner could drop an anvil on my head, right? And that's not safe, even walking outside my door. So it's disingenuous to perpetuate the idea that if you prepare enough in BDSM, you're completely safe because you're never safe. So safer, sure. That's why we say safer sex now and not safe sex, right? And then the uh, word sane a lot of folks in mental health communities, and this this is back years ago. This is not a new thing. This has been going on for a decade, two decades. People were like, I don't know about this. Uh, they're like, yeah, sane is kind of relative. And, and it's kind of ableist. And I know for some of us, it's hard to wrap our heads around why the word sane is ableist. Some people are like, oh, yeah, I get it. And other people are like, I don't know get it, right? I'm not going to spend a whole podcast episode explaining it. But trust, there are enough people that are like, no, no, fam, that's able to like, don't, don't perpetuate the whole idea of sane and insane. And what are the qualifiers for that? And it, it leads into a slippery slope of stigma. So that was another issue with that. So the consent acronym RAC, Risk Aware Consensual Kink, even though it's when we're talking about the spirit of those frameworks, it's the same. They in generally mean the same exact thing. Risk aware 
consensual kink, folks at the time thought that really zeroed in on the minutia a little better, like the details a little bit better. So that's the framework we should use. So today, most kink communities, at least in the US or North America even, and especially the ones that are larger in bigger cities, have younger members, they're more quote, progressive, I guess, in some way, shape, or form, which at this point is the majority of communities in the U.S., right? They pretty much said, okay, safe, sane, and consensual was cool at the time, but it's over now and we go with RAC or there's other acronyms, PRICK, and there's one that's CRASH, you know, there's all sorts of stuff. So, cool. But there are still folks that are like, but but I, I like SSC, right? I have heard folks say on a personal level, they're like, okay, I know that people have issue with SSC, like acknowledged, validated, gotcha. But for me personally, you know, I've talked to folks who have mental health issues and they're like, for me personally, when I hear that word sane, it just triggers in me, like kind of you know, do a quick mental health status check with myself. And it helps me. I like that word sane, right? So for me, that terminology resonates more than rack or prick or CCC or, you know, whatever it is. Absolutely freaking cool, right? And then there's other folks that are like, okay, personally, SSC resonates with me. We can choose whatever we want, which is true. Kink is customizable. Whatever works for you, cool. And especially in the case of mental health, when someone's telling you something's ableist, but it's like, you're a person who has mental health issues that is trying to manage your mental health and spends a lot of time on self-care and doing that, you can use whatever the fuck word you want for yourself, even if it is considered an ableist slur, if you feel that that's taking back for you, more freaking power to you. Awesome. You can call you whatever you want. It's when we start calling other people those things or pushing that language on other people. And they're like, okay, that's really offensive. Or if we we use that language and we don't belong to that marginalized group that it is a slur against like that gets into some you know but when people say well you know i i prefer ssc absolutely cool but you know what whoever the hell has a problem with it and thinks it's ableist is a all the names in the book also ableist slurs that's not so great and it's like we can look at that as like okay Again, that's one person's personal view. And I won't call somebody's harmful, whatever ist, quote, opinion an opinion. But, uh, okay, fine. People can believe what they want to believe. We can't control other people. But when we're those other people and we're talking about our personal preferences, and we're framing them in a way that they are absolutes for everybody else. Like, this is what works for me, or this is what I use, so this is what everybody else should use. Or this is what works for me, and even though other people say it can be harmful in some contexts, they should shut the hell up because they're too sensitive. Like, that's... mm. So, uh, long story short, what I'm saying is... If you are talking about this with other people, whether you're a content creator, whether you're talking about it over brunch with your kinky friends, right? You are educating in a roundabout way. So I beg of you, if we can be more cognizant of like, oh shit, I don't want to be a fucking educator, but I, right now I'm kind of doing it even there. So I should look at things in a more well-rounded way. You know what I'm saying? It's it's a lot. It's just been on my mind. So maybe that was just a bitchy rant, but it's good in any context, not even kink, right? Anything. There's your personal view and then there's like the 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 collective view and the harm that might be caused by things in a collective environment that maybe in your own personal little world isn't harmful, but those are two different things. Anyway, All right. 
Now that we got into that, we're already into the minutia and the nuance and the gray areas and there's no one good answer. And oh my God. So let's move on. We last time were talking about safe words and all of the rules that we have around them. And one of the things that you hear said amongst kinksters often is you should never ever renegotiate or change what you have planned while you are in the middle of that scene. And there's all sorts of reasons for that, right? Maybe you are in subspace and you can't make really good decisions, right? Maybe you are so worked up, you're in a state of frenzy and you're like, I want to do all the things all the time. And that's impairing your judgment. Maybe you would decide to do something that maybe isn't a great idea. or Maybe you've gone a little bit too far, but you're like so in it and so hyped up. You can't see that. Sometimes we go into partner pleasing mode. It could even be, it's not just subs trying to please a dom. It could even be a dom trying to please their sub or give their sub what they're asking for. So they give in and agree to something in the moment that if they had the time to really think about, they'd be like, "Mm, maybe this isn't a great idea. Mm, maybe I'm not really into it and I feel like my arm is being a little twisted. Sometimes our cocktail of chemicals, right? Our adrenaline, all of these things make us feel the sensations in our body differently, namely pain. Maybe something is happening to you that not only really freaking hurts, but you're like so hyped up you can't feel it, but is injuring you. And when you're in the moment, you're, you can't really feel the extent and you might push yourself too far and injure yourself physically. Maybe you legit are being pressured and manipulated by your play partner and you're in the moment. You don't have that time to step back and think and you may agree to something that you really don't want to agree to. There's lots of reasons why people say you should never, ever renegotiate your scene while you are in the middle of that scene. Of course, however, right? Because the really the whole, everything about this episode is like, however, um, because it's all the nuance, all the messy nuance. There are lots of exceptions to that, quote, rule. And remember, No rule is across the board rule. Is this in like a a law book somewhere in the kinky lawyer's office? No, right? It's a best practice. And we know why that best practice exists because all the scenarios that I said. However, let's say you're in the middle of a scene and you're like, I do want to renegotiate because I said, I said, I would uh, let you stick your electric play equipment up my butt and turn it up to 10 and shock the hell out of me while I'm hanging upside down and like all of this stuff, right? And you're doing the same and you're like, I am now not into that. I have changed my mind. I don't want to do it for whatever reason. Of course, you can renegotiate. You can say, hey, I know I said blah, 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 blah. Consent revoked, right? So that is renegotiating mid-scene. And for a lot of us, it's like, well, that's common sense, of course, but not always. Oftentimes, I see this so much. There's somebody who's new to kink, and they don't know. They don't know. And it's hard to think about this stuff logically. Like if we sit back and we go, okay, we can apply this logic thought process to this scenario. And it might be similar to a logic thought process we would have in a vanilla context. But when it has to do with kink and you're new to kink and you're like, I have discovered a part of me that has been buried, hidden, and 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 I'm now letting it out. This is like a life-changing moment in my life. And we are all fucked up in the head about sex in this country, why why it's called American Sex or Podcast is because we're all fucked up about sex. Not that, not America. That is not what we're about. So that scrambles our brains, right? 
it can be the most logical, simple scenario that we could think through if it were anything other than something to do with sex, we could think through it in a flash. Like, of course, of course you do this, not that. This doesn't make any sense. But when you mix sense, sex into it, it scrambles our brains. And people tell us all sorts of stuff. And we're like, I don't know, should I believe it? This is weird. This is kink. I don't know anything about this. Ah. So yeah, new people can get taken advantage of. And the people that prey on folks that want to take advantage of folks that like doing things that are non-consensual, they know that and they use that to, to their advantage. So I've heard many times a manipulative dom, let's say, and this is the stereotypical situation, but it is by all means, it's not always doms. It's not always, you know, just this generic example. Let's say new sub is like, I don't know. I want to change my mind. I, I don't want to do the electrocuting at my butt and hanging upside down thing. And then the Dom is like, do you, but do you remember when you took that BDS on 101 class or when you saw that TikTok or when you read that article or whatever, there's that rule. You, you can't negotiate mid scene. Oh, and you're in, you're in the scrambled brain, uh, you know, subspace new kinkster frenzy. You might be like, oh, shit, that's the rule? Okay, fuck, right? That's not good. <laughs> so that's why that rule exists. And you can definitely like downgrade, you can make any changes that downgrade what you have planned to do. The general rule of thumb is don't add things. Don't do more. Don't request, right? Because that's when your judgment can get clouded. However, that is a general, good general rule of thumb for the vast majority of people. 90 whatever percent of people should stick with that rule and not. Are there times when, let's say, you're a very, very experienced player who's very, very familiar with your dominant, you have a very good rapport and you've been together for years and this and that. And you say, you know what? I decided. Yeah, I want you to add the vampire. I really like the vampire gloves. I should have said, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm super in the mood for them. Okay. I mean, as an educator, right? I got to say like, oh my God, don't do that. Because we also know human nature. You hear that and you think, well, that's me. I, I'm experienced. I've been with my dominant for a long time. I can make those judgments. And then we go ahead and make that judgment and it maybe wasn't the best context or situation to make that judgment. And we regret it later. And we're like, I should never agree. I should have never thought that I trusted this person or that I trusted myself or that, right? Because we always think we are the master of everything. We know everything, right? We are right all the time. Who goes around going, oh, I know that I'm wrong about everything I think, or I know that I just haven't experienced certain things. So I'm underestimating the likelihood of this really fucked up scenario happening. If we all ran around and did that, our lives would be perfect. We'd know everything. Like we're human, right? So we run into issues when we're like, never, ever do blah, blah, blah. You get like the one uh, person who's kinky going, but I've been with them, my dominant a long time. And we really do legitimately. And let's say they do really legitimately sometimes, you know, upgrade during their scenes. And it's always been successful. And it's always, and you're invalidating me. Yeah, that's kind of a flaw in the way all this works, right? It isn't tied up neat with a little bow and always this one, this, always that one, that. Yeah, there may be legitimate exceptions to that rule. However, they're often so few and far between. And the majority of the time, the people that think, well, I'm the exception, end up in a shit bucket, sometimes literally. How do we handle that? There is no easy answer. But you as the kinkster or just the human moving through life, because again, these are very human imperfections, very realistic imperfections in the system of communication amongst people, that keeping that in mind and just knowing that that's a possibility is like worth its weight in gold. So keep that in your head. 
Similarly, you know, you hear people say things like, would never, ever do an impact play scene without warming up the bottom first. Like you have to start slow and you have to use the little feather floggers or, you know, whatever it is. And then you have to work your way up, wait till the areas, you know, kind of reddish and somebody who has light enough skin where you can see that it's turning red or it's turning warm to the touch. Then you can increase. You gotta, again, that is a really good best practice for the majority of people and especially for people who are new But let's say you're a super experienced masochist and you actually get off on like the first hit being the whopper. Okay, like you can make that choice. However, the fact that there are some people out there making that choice doesn't mean it's a great idea for just anyone willy nilly to be like, yeah, hit me with that rubber tire flogger with the pointed ends as hard as you can or like crack a single tail whip against my back until you flay my skin. No. But are there some outlier hardcore players that do that? Yeah. And we have to trust because we, again, we can't control people. There are no thought police. There are no kink police. We have to trust that these folks are self-aware enough and educated enough to really be able to make those decisions for themselves as to how hard they want to play or what rules they want to bend and to be able to do it in a way where they're pulling the wool over their own eyes and getting themselves into trouble. It sucks. It sucks that like humans are like this. Those of you who are parents might be able to relate. Like for me, if you've raised a kid that has gone off into adulthood, when your kid's a teenager or young adult, they're going off and moving out on their own. They get their first long-term significant other partner. Maybe they move in with them. They buy their first car. They go away to college and start going to keg parties. You're like, oh my God, you, oh, you are going to kill yourself or something. You're going to make some decision that is not good. And you want to just like wrap them in bubble wrap. And, but you also have to let them go out and make the, you have to trust that your parenting prepared them or whatever, you know, whatever caregiving or life they had prepared them to make at least okay decisions, right? And we also have to know that even those that you think are gonna make really good decisions are gonna fuck up sometimes. Mistakes are gonna happen people are going to get hurt. And that's like, again, part of being a human. It's the fucked up sucky part of being a human. And for us in the kink community, we need to figure out, we need to navigate, how do we handle that? Like, you're a new person, or you're a person off doing kink without a strong uh, community support, or you are a person that maybe you're not getting the best education and you're doing some things that are really risky and really dangerous, but you don't know. Where is that line between wrapping you in bubble wrap and being like, no, you can't do that to your grown adult and us as a community have to do our best to put the best information out there to make sure people have access to the best resources. But there's going to be a point that we're like, people are going to do shit behind closed doors and we can't be there to watch them. You know, I don't have an answer for that. I don't have an answer for how to fix that. And maybe there isn't an answer for how to fix that. But I, I want to reiterate to all of you like that, that, is where a lot of our problems lie, where we're bickering in the kink community about rules and you should and you shouldn't and don't ever and, you know, that sort of thing. Always. (sighs) I know. It's a lot. It's a lot. So never hitting without a warm up. The vast majority of time, very good best practice. However, 
there may be some exceptions to that rule. And we have to trust that they're self-aware enough and educated enough to know how to do that in a way where they're being intentional, thoughtful, with full informed consent of everybody around them, and in a way that isn't necessarily safe, because again, nothing is safe, but is the safest it can be, right? Where they've mitigated the risk as much as they can. And they are also prepared for the, oh shit, what if it goes wrong? We're playing in kink and really in life, because this is a big life lesson, with some scary stuff. We're taking risks, right? Nothing we do is ever safe. When she moved back to her hometown, Gia never expected to run into Jack. But when she sees him at the local dive bar, she finds herself drawn to him all over again. You want to know what happens next? Or maybe you want to know a whole lot more, don't you? Well, check out this sexy story and many more from Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and characters. Find stories about that intriguing coworker with a British accent or hooking up with your hot yoga instructor. Hear the sexy voices of Sharonis J. Jackson, ER Flightmaster, Luke Cook, and many others in stories like you've never heard before. New content is released every week, so in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. Dipsy also has sleep stories, wellness sessions, and now they offer written stories too. It's your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, or heat things up with a partner. And for listeners of American Sex Podcast, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash sunny. Yes, that's 30 days of full access, absolutely free when you go to dipsystories.com slash sunny. That's dipsystories.com slash sunny. When you know more, you can do more. What if you could use science to discover more about your body? Find out what you need for a healthier tomorrow with Everly Well. Everly Well is digital healthcare designed for you at an affordable and transparent price. They have more than 30 at-home lab tests. You can choose the test that makes the most sense for you to get the answers that you need, like the women's health test or the food sensitivity test. Or consider their STD test, which discreetly allows you to test for seven types of STDs, all from the privacy of your own home. Here's how it works. Everly Well ships you everything you need for your at-home lab test in one package. You simply collect your sample and use the included prepaid shipping label to mail it back to the certified lab. Your physician-reviewed results get sent to your phone in just days. And you can share the results with your primary care physician to help guide next steps. It's so simple. Over 1 million people have trusted Everly Well to support their health and wellness goals including me. I love it. It's so easy. And you know what? You should too. For listeners of American Sex Podcast, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash sunny, S-U-N-N-Y. That's everlywell.com slash sunny for 20% off your next at-home lab test. Everlywell.com slash sunny. We're playing in kink and really in life because this is a big life lesson with some scary stuff. We're taking risks, right? Nothing we do is ever safe. God, I feel like I'm giving you like the kinky auntie talk or something. I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to some other uh, safe word things. So we talked about can you negotiate in the middle of a scene, you know. Uh, Oh, I know. You only have to stop. 
if a safe word is called. Hell no. Hell no. I mean, yes, you definitely need to stop and go into whatever protocol you've agreed when that safe word is called. However, there are plenty of times that someone who knows their safe word, who, you know, seems like maybe they're doing okay and should be able to call it, can't. Sure, sometimes that's the dominant because dominants can use safe words too, just like submissives can. But just by nature of design and the circumstances, it's oftentimes a submissive partner because our submissive partner may be in subspace, they may be physically bound, they may feel mentally bound, they may feel triggered if they're playing, especially with uh, scenes that maybe have more violence or aggression or control even. Sometimes control makes us freeze, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. And it's really important in that situation specifically for dominance to be able to stop and check in. Are you doing okay? And sometimes, let's say I'm a submissive who is kind of triggered, kind of, you know, I'm going into that fight or flight, but I'm I'm going into freeze or I'm going into fawn, where I am just going to agree with everything, give you everything you want in order to try to uh, deescalate whatever's happening. And that's just my emotional knee jerk reaction when I'm in that state. I may not be able to call my safe word. I may not be able, even when you ask me if everything's okay, I might go, yeah, everything's fine right? And that's why we say, if you are first playing with someone, start off slow. Don't do those really intense scenes right away, because they don't know you, you don't know them. One, that's a trust issue. But two, they can't read your other cues, as well as somebody that who's known you for a longer period of time. Right. So when you're dominant, it's like, look for that far off look in the eyes. Look for, you know, whatever it is that your particular partner displays when something is a little off. Right. So just because someone doesn't call a safe word does not mean that you're fine to keep going, doing whatever you want. The safe words are just a tool, one tool. They're not the end all be all, and they are not a game. We see these memes where, you know, somebody's tied up. It's a BDSM situation. And it's like, oh, when you forget the safe word, ha, 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 ha. So you've forgotten the safe word. So you're stuck in this position and being subject to whatever the person's doing to you. Ha, ha, it's such a joke. And it's like, yeah, okay, ha, ha, it's a joke. But people think that's real. So safe words are not a game. They're not a riddle. They're not a ha, you didn't get the word. So you don't know. Absolutely not. Along these same lines, a lot of people say, well, safe words are only for those kinds of scenes where you're doing a role play where no is part of the role play, like CNC, consensual non-consent. And while it is true that safe words are really useful in those types of scenes because no, stop, don't, whatever, are just part of the improv. You're not supposed to listen to those words because the whole point of the role play is you like that resistance, right? And the fighting and the, oh, trying to escape and get away. And it's fun. Uh, resisting. I don't want to. Uh. So how do you know when somebody's no is a real no? So you use a safe word, right? So a lot of folks say, okay. And, and again, I'm going to be stereotypical, but oftentimes I will see this, a dominant will say to a submissive, well, we're not doing a consensual non-consent scene and no just means no. So we don't need a safe word. Just tell me no or tell me don't. In theory, yeah, sure. That makes sense. But think about it. You're a people pleaser, right? You have, um, you have a hard time saying no. You have a whole history with the word no and not being listened to. You have a whole history with any time that you protested something, maybe in your life growing up with your caregivers or a prior ex, right? You would get the pushback. You would get almost punished for saying no. You would regret protesting and saying no. So you've learned, you're conditioned yourself not to say no. And when you do say no, it feels really fucking weird and you don't like to do it. So you just agree, 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 right? 
if you're in a situation then, if that's you, which that is the story for a lot of folks in our society who have been raised as, as women and girls, we're conditioned to give up our autonomy, to not protest, to not say no, right? If if that's you and you're in a scene, you're in subspace and you're kind of intimidated, you're kind of freaked out and you're going into, you know, freeze or fawn. I've had times in my life, not just in kink, but just even in everyday situations where I go to open my mouth and I want to say no and I just freeze. I can't do it. Nothing comes out. And of of course, um, you know, that's what therapy is for. But again, safe words are a tool. So sometimes it's going to be much easier for me to blurt out Richard Nixon or red than the actual word no. So whether you're dominant, whether you're submissive, whether you're whatever, I encourage you to listen to the partners that you're playing with to have fallback, quote, safe words. So that could be an actual traditional safe word. This is Richard Nixon, red, banana, pineapple. It can be no, if you're not doing a, a consensual non consensual No, it also a nonverbal safe word, two taps on the arm, right? Give all the options, all the tools. If you're trying to, I don't know, do a home improvement project, you just want to be like, okay, I got this hammer and that's it. And I hope that's enough to take care of putting together this shelving unit. Or would you rather have like, well, I know I got an Allen wrench. I got a hammer. I got um, a screwdriver. I got some pliers. I got a wrench. I got a, you know, whatever it is. I've got the tool. I think I only need the hammer. But just in case I'm wrong and there's some funky screws in there, right? Think I only need the flathead, but just in case I got the Phillips right next to me. It's like that. We need all the tools at our disposal because then we have more options and we have more opportunities to find what works for us in the moment. That's what a safe word's for. And then I hear people say another safe word, uh, absolute or rule. Well, safe words are for BDSM. They're for scenes. They're for, you know, whatever. You, you can't use them outside of that. Who says? Who's, who says that? I mean, I know who says that, but it's rhetorical. Uh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Safe words are amazing for vanilla situations, for emotional relationship situations, for even platonic situations with family, friends, etc. right? We all know, if you grew up in America, if someone says, uncle, I call uncle, people know what that means, right? So a safe word, as we said in the last uh, episode, is a communication tool that gives us a quick and easy way to communicate something that may be complex, difficult to communicate in the moment, and that triggers a predetermined protocol. So you don't have to make decisions in the moment. You don't have to be like, oh, what do I need? I think I need this. I think I need you to do that. I don't know. It's already been determined. So in BDSM, call safe word. Let's say that safe word for us stops the scene, right? The protocol we set up is we go immediately into aftercare. I have my aftercare supplies over in the corner. You know what those aftercare supplies are. You can go bring them to me. If I ask that I would like you to hug me and tell me I'm a good girl. You already know to do that. So I don't have to ask you in the moment where I'm in like some weird jelly need puddle of orgasm and all sorts of different emotion state and I can barely talk because that protocol has been predetermined. And all I have to do is say Richard Nixon, (laughs) pineapple, right? And it triggers all of these things. Beautiful. It is beautiful. So Why can't we do that in other situations? For instance, 
Ken and I did this years ago before we realized that therapists actually recommend people do this. Then we were like, look at us, pat on the back. Um, Raising teenagers is hard, right? One of your jobs as a parent is to, to model for them how to regulate emotion, how to handle when things feel too big, too overwhelming, how to advocate for yourself, that, all those things. As with teenagers, you start getting into a conversation. Then it turns into a little debate. Then it turns into yelling. Then it turns into, ah, you're the worst mom. And stomping down the hallway, door slamming, huge argument, right? And we've been in those situations, whether it's with a kid or with anyone, like lots of arguments start percolating and escalating. You could feel it escalating. And if someone was able to say, oh my goodness, I feel this escalating. I need to shut it down. Or shit's going to be bad. I'm going to throw something and slam my door and, you know, whatever. Say, you're the worst mom and I hate you. And then I'm going to regret it later. Have a tool to shut it down. So like for the kids, it was like, yeah, emotions are hard to handle. You don't know what that gauge is when you've hit that point of like, I'm about to hit the point of emotional no return and it is too overwhelming. It's too much. So we had the safe word jelly bean. And when it got too overwhelming, and like, you know, your parents are breathing down your neck, like, bah, 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 and you're like, oh, fuck this shit. Instead of it blowing up, you can, you get to say jelly bean. And then we negotiated all together. What happens when we say jelly bean? Okay, shuts down. Not a fucking word from the parents. Not a, but you never, but you didn't, but why do you always? Nope, shut that shit down. You get to go to your room. You get to go do whatever. Uh, and we we had it, like some people say, you know, walk away for 20 minutes and then regroup. Our emotions were high in our household. So it was like, okay, we can take it up the next day. But then we made protocols where we would promise to take it up the next day. We would have these things in place to make sure it just didn't fall by the wayside and get ignored. And that worked really well. And it helped teach them how to regulate their own emotions and to have a little bit of control and autonomy when it feels like all the grownups are wagging their finger at you and yelling at you and telling you, you know, you suck. Cool. So yeah, that's a safe word. And when we did, we're like, we just gave our kids a safe word because we used, we learned it from kink, right? We're like, are we horrible? Like, are we, is it, and we're like, no. Okay, let's logic this out, right? It's, it has nothing to do with anything sexual, anything kinky. It we're using it as a communication tool for when things get too escalated to handle. It is a quick, easy, accessible tool to shut it down, to try to maintain control of your own autonomy and de-escalate stuff. Cool. Okay, it worked. And then later. I learned, yeah, therapists recommend establish an emotional safe word with your significant other, with your kids, with whoever. So we can use safe words in any freaking context we want. They're a communication tool. I have a grocery safe word. It's, it's silly. It's, it's like a tongue in cheek thing, but it actually works. When I get home from the grocery store, we have a deep freezer in the garage, you know, and I, I have a shelf where I put like the extra toilet paper and things, right? So I go, I open the car, open the hatchback, go through, put the things that belong in the deep freezer in the deep freezer, and put the things that belong on the shelf in the garage there, blah, 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 blah. And then at that point, then I'm like, family, come help me. And we were getting all confused. Like they would come out and help me. And I'd be like, get out. I have not finished putting the things in the freezer. And you're going, you, you're bringing the freezer things in the house. I'm not going to bring it back. Oh, blah, blah. They would never know when to come. And then when I started like, just like yelling in the house, like groceries. Okay, I'm ready. I don't know why that would just, it just didn't sink in. So it was a funny tongue in cheek thing. When I, opened the garage door and yelled into the house wasabi. That meant I was done with my grocery weirdness in the garage and it was time for help. And yeah, I, I just now scream wasabi into the house and everyone knows, okay, mom's done with this. She needs that. Blah, blah, blah. We're good. So yeah, you can use safe words for whatever you want. Another uh, safe word misnomer that I hear 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you two more safe word misnomers. One is, oh, God, this grinds my gear. Submissives can abuse safe words. Oh, it's awful. Submissives just call them the safe word willy nilly when they shouldn't be calling it. They can abuse safe words and da 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 da. Mm, no. First of all, get the notion of submissives can abuse safe words out of your head. The notion that, well, they can use them disingenuously when they don't really need to, yada, 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 yada. Because that's what causes us to not believe it when somebody is advocating for themselves. Even if we tell ourselves, oh, no, no, of course I will take that seriously. It'll plant that little seed of doubt. Like, well, are they really, are they, is it real? Is it real this time, right? Nobody has to justify their use of safe words to anybody else. Nobody has to justify their revoking of consent or changing of mind or downgrading a scene to anybody. And that opens the door for others to judge, well, was that a real safe word? Are you really serious? So stop. Don't do that. Okay. Are safe words sometimes mm, misunderstood? I'll put it that way. Sure. There can be times, right, where let's say there's a submissive who uses a safe word as if it's part of the scene. You know what I mean? As if it's a no in a consensual non-consent scene. Like, no. Okay, just kidding. Do it. No. Okay, just no. All right. It might be red, right? No, that's not cool. However, listen to the safe word right? This is when we have a conversation and we go, hey, we're not on the same page. Let's go back to negotiation. Let's talk about how we do and don't use safe words. And I'm going to say this, this is kind of, yeah, I guess it is a, a universal rule or best practice, even though there aren't many out there. But safe words are sacred, right? Just like saying no is sacred. It needs to be listened to. And safe words also exist outside of that scene or the role play or the safe container of kink or the dynamic or whatever you want to call it. They exist outside of that. They're a tool that the autonomous part of us uses, the part of us that is not a submissive, that is not a dominant, that is a you are you advocating for yourself. Safe words exist in that space. They are not part of the scene. So guess what? In that situation, you listen to the safe word, you do whatever protocol is negotiated, and then you have a conversation. And this isn't something that happens all the time. It's not like super common occurrence, but it could happen. Sure. Right. You have a conversation. And then usually at that point, vast majority of time it's like, oops, my bad. I totally didn't realize like safe words were used that way. I get it now. Cool. We're on the same page. Everything's fine. Right. And if not, let's say that person is just a dick, then maybe they are not the partner for you. And I'm giving this fictitious made up situation. Again, do situations like this happen? Sure. Are they common? No. Right. It's not every other person just like saying a safe word just to fuck with you. Then there is the notion that some people have well, somebody's calling a safe word because they aren't serious. They have an itch on their nose. They have to go to the bathroom. That's not what safe words are for. It's not real. They're abusing their safe word. Go back and listen to the episode I did just before this. We talked all about that. Safe words can be used for anything you want. And you don't have to justify them for anyone. And in an ideal situation, which should be most of them, or at least what we strive for, we should have those conversations during our negotiation. Like, hey, sometimes I might say for it just because like I'm uncomfortable or I need a five minute breather. Like safe words to me don't mean big emergency, something wrong right? And if someone tells you, if a partner says, well, you can only use a safe word only if it's a dire emergency, like it's like go to the hospital time. And aside from that, you're not allowed to use a safe word. That's when I say run. That's not, you need ways to advocate for yourself in all situations. 
Are there situations where somebody will say, quote, a sub is abusing their safe word because I gave them a punishment that we agreed to, and now they're safe wording out of their punishment? That's not cool. Are they just trying to get out of this? Again, in my experience, right, I'm not the end all be all, but I've seen a lot. The vast majority of the time, if people are safe wording, out of their punishment, there's a good reason. And people are allowed to safe word out of punishments. You can revoke your consent at any time. And then it is up to you to get together and have a conversation about it. You know what? Okay. Is it just a temporary thing? You know, is it just today? Is it something about this punishment you don't like and you want to change what the punishments are, right? And again, you don't have to do this in a way where you're trying to divulge the reason out of the person that they safe worded, just to get a gauge. Like maybe we agreed on a punishment that we both thought was going to be great. And now that we're doing it, it's like, oh, that that wasn't a great idea. Like this, this punishment is truly not just unfun, because maybe we want our punishments to be a little unfun, but it is it has crossed my boundaries. That's when you step back and you renegotiate. That's not abusing a safe word. Or maybe a partner agreed, uh, I don't know, you know, you can use this flogger on me. And every three hits, they're like, red, yellow, red, yellow, red. Well, they're not abusing their safe word. There's a mismatch somewhere, right? Maybe you're thinking you can go a little bit harder than they were assuming you would go. There's some sort of disconnect. So that's when we stop and talk. Like, let's say your safe word means like, we're just going to take a break and we're going to talk and kind of regroup and figure out what we're doing. That's when you go, okay, so I notice you're safe wording a lot. And I think that something's off that we need to kind of recalibrate something. Is this, do you not like this toy? Do you, is it, you know, maybe I'm doing it too hard. Do you want to change to something else? Like let's figure out why you are repeatedly not enjoying yourself and it's continuing and continuing. There's something that needs to be readjusted here. That's not abusing your safe word. That's advocating for your own comfort limits, whatever. Right? So. I wish the whole notion of, quote, abusing a safe word would throw itself in the trash because it causes a lot of not believing people when that's not good for anybody. And the last, the last safe word misnomer or rule that I hear that doesn't always apply and has exceptions is you must never make achieving someone saying their safe word in a scene your goal. You must never, as a top, push somebody until they safe word. That is abusive. Okay, so if that's not what you negotiated, then yeah, that can be abusive. You keep pushing someone and pushing someone and and they didn't tell you, hey, I want to be pushed to my limit. Yeah, that's a problem. But this is something that you decide in negotiation. And this is something I have on my negotiation sheets and my mini workbook is in this scene, is your goal to be pushed to your limit or to hold back and never get to that threshold at all? Because that says a lot. Some people want to get to the point where they have to cry uncle. Maybe they want to feel emotionally broken. They want to feel the pain that they can't take anymore. That's their goal. That's what they're after. That's what they like. That's what they're looking forward to. Cool. Agree on a protocol for that and agree that is the goal for both of you and figure out a way to do that in a way that works for everybody in a way that is, uh, you know, mitigating risk, that is being intentional, that is focusing on making this the as safe as possible to make sure everyone in the scene is as autonomous and in control of their own consent 
as possible to make sure that they have many tools for communicating that at their disposal at all times. Cool. You can do that. You know, I love to do scenes that are interrogation scenes, for instance. And a very simple, basic example of this is like, you give someone a secret code, they're a secret spy, right? And they have the secret code. And maybe it's a series of four numbers. It's like a pin number, you know, one, two, three, four, right? And y'all know what the code is. You both know, but you make them give it to you. And you use that code as a safe word. Like if they're at the point where it's like, I'm done. And maybe that's not a bad I'm done. Maybe that's just like, I'm tired. We've been at this for two hours. My butt's kind of sore. Like, I'm just going to give you the code now. Like, we're cool. Let's, let's cuddle. Awesome. So at any time they can, you know, maybe I'm just going to give you one digit. I'm going to give you the one, but I'm not going to give you any more. Right. And then maybe me as the submissive, if I'm sort of, I know I'm sort of getting towards the end. I might be like, fine, I'll give you another digit. The other digits too, but I'm not quite ready to give you the other two digits yet. And then I get to the point where I'm like, okay, I've had about all I can take. All right. The last two digits are three, four. The scene's over. Cool. You've gone to the goal of safe words. I I highly recommend in those scenes, you also have traditional safe words and, you know, nonverbal safe words and other means to not just make that your only safe word, but that's right there, playing with safe wording as the goal. Again, it's a best practice. Should people who are doing their very first scenes ever go to that length to play to their threshold or pass their threshold? Probably not a great idea. But it's something that people do. So that never, ever makes safe wording your goal. No, not not really. So that was a lot about safe words and kink and those weird, nuancy gray areas that have no real answer and so many exceptions to the rule, but the exception's only really a good exception that is potentially not harmful to you if it's done in a very intentional way with logic. But even if you do it in that way, there's no guarantee that it will ever turn out okay, or that you will be quote safe in the end. Uh, Yeah, the shit we do is messy, just as humans, just as humans, not even as kinksters. But hopefully this helped. Uh, when you are in situations that are a bit more complex, or you meet different people outside of your norm, or from different groups, you know, regionally, we tend to resemble each other. When I was in Chicago, they called Chicago a very heavy, rough body play and psychological humiliation, mind fuck kind of town in our kink scene and we get people from other areas like what the fuck is wrong with you people you be-? and to us that was just like well that's just the way we all you know do it here so know that when you meet different people from different areas or different communities or people who are new you're all going to be on slightly different pages and these nuances and differences and gray areas may pop up even a little bit more than they already pop up all the fucking time. So on that note, I hope all of that was helpful. Either your brains are scrambled right now and you're like, fuck, it's hard to be a human. It's hard to be a kinkster. And what if something goes wrong? Yeah, it's kind of like being a teenager or getting your first apartment or your first car or whatever. It's scary, right? Or even taking your first steps as a toddler, really close to the top of the stairs or something. It's nothing we ever do in life is guaranteed to be safe and and to feel good and to have a good outcome. And even though the prospect of that can be scary sometimes, it's also part of the fun. It's part of what, what makes, I don't know, us humans human and life life. So on that note, go be reflective, go smack some asses, And I will see you on the next episode of American Sex Podcast. Bye, American fuckers. 
Thanks for listening to American Sex. What's that? You want more? Well, you can start by streaming our TV show on Showtime, Sex with Sunny Megatron. Then pop on over to SunnyMegatron.com. Everything's there. You can get updates on my new book, check out my sex ed and BDSM workshops, learn how to book me for your organization or for coaching. You know, we also want to hang out with you too, right? So come join our Discord community or follow along on TikTok or Instagram, Twitter, all the social media. I'm Sunny Megatron everywhere. And you can catch Ken on Twitter or tune in to his weekly D&D games on Twitch. If you want to support the show, a great way to do that is simply to tell people about it. Make a TikTok or tweet about your favorite part of this episode. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe and leave a review too. And if you're a ride or die American fucker, you're going to want to join our Patreon community. We'll send you official American fucker stickers and you'll get a lot more too at patreon.com slash American sex. Now, just in case you happen to be one of the few that still has disposable income in this late stage capitalist hellscape, well, when you're shopping for a new sex toy, BDSM gear, Kink Academy membership, or other things, please patronize our sponsors and affiliates. You'll get a discount and it helps us too. Win-win. All those links and codes are in our show notes. Thanks, American fuckers. We appreciate the heck out of you. See you next time.